Psalm 25. As any parent of young children will tell you, one of the most difficult lessons that we have to teach our children is the lesson to wait. It just seems like it, it just is a difficult, it's one you have to teach over and over and over again. I know my own experience is that repeatedly I find myself saying things like, just, just wait, just wait just a minute, G- give it a minute, it's okay, or just trust me, it, it's all right. And that's just a, it, it plays out over and over again. We somehow come out automatically with this wiring in our brain that thinks that our perspective and our timing is just infallible. It, cu- it couldn't possibly be wrong. Not only do we want things to happen right away, we want them to happen exactly as we envision it happening, exactly as, as it go, we think it should go down. And it's really impossible uh, if, if, if we think about it, it's impossible to imagine a good scenario where things don't happen exactly the way that we want them to happen or exactly when we want them to happen. That's, that's impossible for us to think. But as we grow up, that tendency towards impatient, that tendency to, to want to be in control, that need to be in control, that doesn't really necessarily go away. In fact, uh, it, we continue to battle it throughout our lives. In life, having to wait is hard enough. The idea of not knowing what the outcome may be, it may not look the way that we want it to look, that's even harder for us to take sometimes. And yet this morning we read that David is in that place of waiting. That's where he is in this psalm. He's facing a very uncertain future. And all the questions, the, these inevitable questions that come along with an uncertain future, just they start to flood into his mind. I'm sure he's wrestling with the same questions that, that come to our mind. If I wait on God, will it be worth it in the end? What, what if? What if this time he doesn't come through? Have you heard those thoughts before? Maybe there's an area of your life this morning where you're wrestling with that exact question. All of us are going to have to come face to face with it at some point. Do I trust God enough to actively wait on him? Do I trust him enough to actively wait on him? So with that in mind, let's read Psalm 25 together. This is God's holy word. Of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. O guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. And may the Lord bless his word and the preaching of his word this morning. You may see a little number there beside 25, Psalm 25, in your text. It's got a footnote at the bottom that explains that in the original, this, this was Hebrew poetry. 
and every verse, every, every meter of the poetry would have started with a different six, it's an acrostic, uh, the, the, it's like A to Z in the Hebrew alphabet, so every successive verse is, is the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and so just know at the outset that the structure that we're going to try to group this together in this morning, it's not going to do justice to the ingenious writing that this is. So uh, you'll, you'll just have to bear with that today. But we are going to be able to trace, there's, there's a few groupings that we want to be able to trace some broad shifts in this passage together. And we want to see how each of those shifts, they reveal that waiting on God in the Bible, waiting on God in Scripture, is not a passively wishing on a possibility. It's not resigning ourselves to some fate that we don't really know. Now, waiting on God in the Bible, biblical ex- definition of it, is an active hoping in a certainty. We have to nail that down in our minds. It's an active hoping in a certainty. In the first seven verses, we're going to see that active hoping involves looking to God. In verses 8 through 14, we'll also see that active hoping involves a meditating on God. And in verses 15 to 19, we see that active hoping involves a leaning on God. I know you're saying, Bart, there's, there's 22 verses. You only got to 19 in your sections. Don't worry, we're going to get to all of it. So let's dive into that first section. David is not indecisive. He's actively looking to God. This is not an indecisive moment in his life. Notice both the earnestness and the orientation of David's prayers. Waiting on God requires both, this earnestness, this eagerness, and an orientation. You see how many times he uses the word to you, you, and yours. To, he says, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. This is a man of action. He's used, to, he's used to being in command and in control. And yet here he is entrusting himself completely to this covenant-keeping God of Israel. And then he repeats the request with this deeply personal resonance. He's not only Israel's God. Personally, he's David's God. He says, oh, my God, in you I trust. That's the tone of somebody that you would the tone that you would take with somebody that you know really well, somebody who knows you, somebody that you've kind of been through it with, so to speak. That's how he's, that's how he's addressing the Lord. And you can feel the fervency. Despite the literary skill of this psalm, the way that it's composed, this is not David sitting down in an easy chair. He's not waxing eloquently from a desk thinking this is going to sound really good. So no, the psalm itself is arising, it's arising out of his life and death struggle that he's in the middle of. And we see the desperation kind of start to show up at the end of verse 2. He says, let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. And that's right there where we can start to feel just the humanness of the psalm. We can begin to relate to it because all of us have been in, in, in those paralyzing moments in life. Or, or we, we, know, we can imagine what it would be like to be in his shoes. What do you do? in that moment? Where do you turn? Is your first instinct in that, in that moment in life to just try to turn and try to piece something together and see if we can't figure something out? That doesn't mean that we don't act. I'm not saying that. But David's instinct, David, David's example here is something for us to heed. We're supposed to let our actions flow out of entrusting ourselves to God. When we do act, it's out of faith and in trust in Him. Listen, none of us None of us is built to carry the burdens of this life on our own. Nobody in this room is built to carry the burdens that you're going to be faced with in the course of your lifetime. And like David, we need to be ready to trust and look to the Lord. Hidden in verse 3, we catch the first glimpse of what's allowing David, what's undergirding David's willingness to do that. Why would he look to the Lord? Well, you see that his, his, his certainty. Indeed, none verse 3, none who take refuge in you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. David's convinced that no, no matter how it looks on the outside, no matter how it may even feel in his own heart, which we'll get to, we'll see that there's turmoil within him. No matter all those things, despite all of those things, he's convinced that God is going to act. That God has not forgotten. He's not going to miss. When David looks to God, David, God's not going to miss that. In the middle of handling all these other requests and crises, he's not going to let this one slip through the cracks. David knows that he's not going to be the first person that God is going to miss. None who wait for you shall be put to shame. He's not an exception. And church, neither are we when we look to God. 
Notice also that looking to God, it means growing in the knowledge of God. David's petition in, petition in verses 4 and 5 tells, shows us that. He asks, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. And teach me, for you are the God of salvation. For you I wait all the day long. You see how this personal, me, do that for me. I wait for you. There's this connection of learning about God and learning about his ways and us waiting on him all the day long. It's an active waiting. David's probably towards the end of his life when he pens these words. And so he, it'd be an easy for him, having been in the position that he's in and having the experience that he's had, to begin to settle into his own way of doing things, to just, to just live and trust his own perspective. And yet here what we see is that David instead has a deeper longing to know the ways of God. He's grown more suspicious of his own heart, and he's seen the limitations of his perspective. And so that doesn't mean that David hasn't made any progress in his walk with the Lord. In fact, it means that this instinct to patiently trust God, to look to God for his guidance, that is the progress. That is the progress that he's made in his walk with the Lord. And that, inst that instinct is really instructive for us as well because we notice that he's not primarily interested in some subjective sign or some omen. That would have been the way that, as a, as a king of the ancient Near East back in his day, that would have been what you looked for. You went and you tried to consult the deities uh, in your kingdom, trying to figure out, give, give me some kind of sign. Just let me know, what do I do here? It's not waiting. They weren't, they weren't so much waiting as they were just guessing because they had no assurance they had no assurance whatsoever that their deities would hear them, first of all. Second of all, they didn't, they didn't have any assurance that their deities would even respond if they did. Maybe scary, scariest of all, they had no assurance that their deities, when they did act, they would act consistently. They had nothing to wait on. Their deities were whimsical. They were moody. Those are tyrants. You can't wait on gods like that. You can't be patient with gods like that. The eternal fixed ways of God are what allowed David to wait and to look to him, to give him those assurances that he could rest in. And the more that David knew of them, the more that he understood God's ways, and really the more that we understand those ways from Scripture, the more that we're able to depend on them. Can God use signs and circumstances in our life? Sure, absolutely. He can use those things in our lives to guide us. But we want to be careful that those things are not self-serving, and we want to be careful when we look to God's ways that this is not a, that, 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 that's an objective thing that, that's our foundation rather than subjective signs. Our foundation has to be the eternal ways of God. And secondly, we notice from his inst instinct, we've already touched on this, but also in verse 5, notice that David isn't interested in only gaining head knowledge. He's not trying to win a debate at this point in his life. He's got an intensely personal interest in knowing the ways of God. He intends for God's self-revelation to actually guide his very steps and his very decisions in that moment. That's, that's what he wants. Cold, stale theology is not waiting on God. That's not what waiting on God looks like. David has no time for that, and neither do we, because his concerns are too pressing. Two intense issues really are, are driving in on him. They're just tightening down on him. Obviously, he has enemies. There are plenty of people in his kingdom that are either silently hoping or they're blatantly working for his kingdom and his, his, his reign to fail. Wantonly treacherous people are all around him as he describes them. And by this point in his life, he's probably experienced multiple times of being stabbed in the back or some sort of unjust oppression. He knows what it's like to have to sleep with one eye open. But as aware as he is of those people and those circumstances and those very real needs... He knows of an even greater need at this point in his life, and it's driving him to look to God. He's aware of his own sin. Look in verses 6 and 7. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. The sins of my youth and transgressions is not the kind of language that we use today. You're not going to find it out there very often. We're much more familiar with phrases like sowing my wild oats or a lapse in judgment or a mistake. 
So how can David freely admit these things to God? How can, he, how can he confess these things to the Lord? He's aware of how serious his sin is against God. He knows, he knows the, the, re, the repercussions of his sin towards the Lord. And yet here he is. He's actively bringing his sin, his confession to the Lord. Listen, David's a sinner just like the people who were oppressing him. He, he has no reason on his own. He's not inherently better than them. His expectations that God would act on his behalf, his looking to God, is not based on the fact that he's better than them. That, that's, that's not what, what David is looking for. David knows he, God has a good memory. And he knows that the passage of time cannot fix David's record of wrongdoing before the Lord. Rightfully, David, he knows that he should be expecting sorrow and wrath from the hand of God. But David doesn't expect that. David doesn't expect that. Looking to God for David involves looking outside of ourselves, even looking outside of our sin, to something greater. It lays claim to God's certain mercy. In our world of immediate fixes, actively looking to God's mercy is a lost art. But that's still our greatest need, and it's still his mercy hasn't ceased in this day. I wonder if we're so convinced of God's mercy and his steadfast love toward us that we're willing to wait on that instead of trying to immediately fix the sin problem by trying to minimize our sin or rationalize it away or even possibly excuse it. David was certain of God's steadfast love. It was a sure thing for him. It had been established of old, and there's no chance. David knew there was no chance it was going to fall apart in his own life, that it was going to fail in his life. That may feel counterintuitive, but waiting on God, waiting on God is the surest way to experience his steadfast love and his mercy. Outside of God, really, there's no such thing as a guarantee of mercy for you outside of God. It's not anywhere to be found. But God's very nature doesn't allow, it doesn't allow when we come to him and we present our sin to him, and we call out for mercy, we plead for mercy, his very nature doesn't allow that to go unheeded. His faithfulness compels him to act in kindness towards sinners who call on him. That's why David could bring his sin to God. That's what allowed him to to look to the Lord with his sin, with that need in his life, because he knows that there's nothing in the universe that's more certain, that's more fixed, that's more sure than God acting for the sake of his own name. It's the most certain thing David could count on. God is going to be consistent. His steadfast love and his mercy are from of old, and he does not change. And that's why we look to him. That's why David could look to him with the sin and the need for, his, need for forgiveness. And so we see that active hoping involves looking to God. Secondly, active hoping involves meditating on God in verses 8 to 14. In the midst of his petition, David just pauses. And he begins to recount all the things that he knows to be true about who God is and how he acts. And as he does that, it's like this dam breaking in his mind. All these sweet truths just come flooding into his heart. And he begins to think, God is good. God is upright. This isn't a deity who begrudgingly dispatches help from a long ways away. He's saying, you know, from over here, I'm just going to drop some help over. This is a faithful Savior instead, who's powerfully and personally leading his people moment by moment. And look at how God rewards those who wait on him. He instructs sinners in the way. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, our sin is described as having each of us having turned to our own way. That's how sin is described in the Old Testament. We naturally, like we talked about our perspective that we're born with, we naturally reject God's ways for our own ways and our own thoughts. And yet here's this beautiful picture, really, of a loving, gentle parent who's kneeling down to teach his children. He's patiently instructing. He's carefully leading He's joyfully teaching the humble. He's a, he's, a, he's a careful instructor. He wastes nothing in his lessons. Think about, those, think about the impact that your favorite teachers had on your life. Just the difference that that teacher has made for you and how good they were at teaching you things and helping you understand and grasp concepts that maybe you, you weren't able to grasp when you were or see things differently and really be able to wrap your mind around it. And what a difference that makes in your life. And, and how grateful that you are for God having put that teacher in your life. And yet, that's only a small echo 
of this great teacher, this great teacher who has committed himself. Man, it, there's times he, he should have failed me many grades, but he's committed himself faithfully to walk with me and to guide me. And so we have this great reward of guidance for those who are meditating on the Lord. We see that as a great reward. And in these next two meters in verses 10 and 11, they feel a little abrupt at our first glance. He says, All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his commandments and testimonies. And that's immediately followed by this confession. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And we see that these, these are two standalone affirmations. They're both true, and yet there's this link between them. There's a link between them. If we spend some time, we start to see how the first truth, it starts to emerge, how this first truth really begins to fuel the second truth, right? It's by meditating on God's steadfast love, on his faithfulness towards us, and seeing how he has committed himself to us, and seeing how patient he is in guiding us, and responding to our requests, and to teaching us, even when we, we have looked away. It's by meditating on that that we can begin to feel our unfaithfulness towards him. It begins to show up just how one-sidedness this commitment can be and how little of the bargain on our own we've held up. Our sin against him, David recognizes, my sin in this arrangement, my sin against you is often. It's great. But notice again that there's this assurance that God is eagerly waiting to pour out on those who fear him, who recognize that discrepancy, who begin to confess that and bring it to him. There's the assurance of guidance, which we just touched on briefly, but what a wonderful assurance. The one who fears the Lord has the assurance that God is behind each of his steps. Some of you need to know that this week. You're walking out steps to work, or you're, walking, you're getting up to serve in your home, or you're going to school, or whatever it may be, or maybe you're getting on a plane to go overseas. Some of you need to know that God is guiding your steps, to have that assurance. Listen, God's hand is involved in guiding each and every one of our decisions, big and small, seemingly mundane and life-changing. David, right here in this moment, he's facing massive challenges, massive challenges. Every step that he takes, is, he knows it's going to have immense repercussions, not only for him, his family, but also for the entire nation. He feels that weight. He feels that need on himself, and yet he feels this need for guidance. Listen, he probably has a thousand different people telling him a thousand different opinions of what he needs to do in this moment. You know what you need to do? You know what that feels like? Just everybody weighing in. And what he needs most, what he needs most as he faces this challenge is this assurance. God is going to guide me. God is going to lead me. In this chaos, there's an assurance there. It also brings his soul. His soul will abide in well-being. And his offspring will inherit the land. David's not exactly sure how all of this is going to turn out. But here's both an assurance for David. It's, it's an assurance in the moment, and it's also an assurance for the future, for what's to come. David, why should you wait on the Lord right now? Well, he, he's looking here, and he's recounting, and he's remembering. He's discovering again afresh in, this, in these two verses, just, just two things here. Only in him is my soul able to rest. In the midst of these challenges, only in God, as I look to him and as I meditate on him, as I trust in him, only there can I find rest. And only there is this absolute assurance of the future that I need. We should not take for granted the certainty of a blessed future. We're supposed to use that and meditate on it and use it to actively hope in a certainty. We're supposed to do what David is doing here. Spend time recounting that. Let, let our souls abide in the good of that. Will it be worth it in the end? David says, I'm reminding myself, the offspring of the one who fears the Lord is going to be the one who inherits the earth. He's going to be the one that's left standing in the end. And then comes the greatest and most wonderful blessing, the friendship of the Lord. The original idea in this term was kind of an inner counsel, being brought into a trusted confidant, being, being in the inner circle, we, and we should just stop on this one. This one, this is one of those moments where you just kind of step back and you just can meditate on this. And it could bring assurance and, 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 and just joy to our souls. We aren't used to, to this. We aren't used to this. This is what we're used to. The world says, I'm willing to associate with you if it benefits me somehow. 
We're careful who we let into that inner circle because we don't want our reputation necessarily to take a hit because of somebody else. We see this play out time and time again in every area of society, don't we? Something negative may come out in the media or at work or at school, and immediately people start to just kind of back away, maybe even in your family. Something, something that, that, doesn't, that causes people just to, even it doesn't have to be true, but they begin to hedge their relationship t- towards us. So how hard it is, how difficult it is to wrap our minds around somebody who knows us fully, who's seen it all, who's seen us in our unattractiveness, who's seen us in our filth, and yet he is the one, he is the one here saying he's willingly willing to associate himself with us, to unwaveringly be known as our friend. I wonder if we believe this morning that the friendship of the Lord is for us. Do you believe that? Maybe that's your thoughts. That's for somebody else. That's for somebody who's got it all together and who, who looks the part. Surely if, if he actually saw who I was, he'd want to keep me kind of at an arm's distance. If he truly knew what was going on in my mind, he wouldn't want to be seen with me. That's the way we think because that's, that's the way we are. And yet as we open our Bibles, we, we read the opposite. The pages, they reveal a Savior who's a friend of sinners. Where's the wisdom of this age that can compare with that? A holy God who is morally revolts by our sin is so committed. He's so committed to steadfast love and mercy that he takes it on himself in order to make a way back to him. That's the story that we read. I wonder this morning if you believe that the friendship of the Lord is for you. Actively hoping involves meditating on God. It involves learning his ways. Yes, thinking about God's holiness, and as we learn his ways, his holiness, it increases and reveals the depths of our sin. That, that, that happens. But how shocking is this? Instead of that, instead of that making your future less sure, look at what it does. Those who fear God, those are the very ones to whom he makes known his covenant. See that at the end of verse 14? Those who are aware of their sin and, they, and they're aware of God's holiness and they fear him, and they come to him, and they meditate on him, and they look to him, those are the ones he makes known his covenant. Do you want your soul to be anchored in the assurance that God is for you? Spend some time meditating on him, waiting on him, learning about him, and recounting those truths in your heart and in your mind. And we see from David that doing that leads to this last part. Finally, actively hoping involves leaning on God. Look at verse 15. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. This meditation on God and the assurances that it's brought into David's life, it allows him to do something. It allows him to fix his eyes on the Lord rather than his circumstances. He's in the midst of a rough, uncertain season, and yet that's what it allows him to do. Listen, leaning on God, leaning on God means bringing the specific things that we're dealing with to God. We know he's sufficient to not just meet our needs in general, but to meet each one of those needs specifically. There's an unbreakable connection here between the truths that David has recounted and meditated on and thought about God and the needs that he brings to God. Those two are, in his mind, that's one leads to the other. And we need to pay attention to that because I'll bet that the needs that you're going to see in these verses I'll bet those are some of the same needs that you deal with and have dealt with. In verse 16, he says, he's lonely and afflicted. For David, it feels like there's nobody that he could confide in. He feels abandoned and deserted. And yet he can ask the Lord to turn and be gracious to him because he knows for sure that the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. In verse 17, he talks about the troubles of his heart being enlarged. Inside, he's dealing with this inner turmoil, anxiety, and sorrow. And it feels overwhelming for David. They've they've grown in his heart. But he pleads for God to bring him out. He pleads for God to to bring him out of his distresses. Because the soul who fears fears God, that soul is going to be the one who abides in well-being. See this connection here between the things that he's remembered about God and the things that he's bringing to God. 
There's specific things about God's character that he knows to be true that's allowing him to bring specific needs to be addressed by this God of all sufficiency. That's really important. Verse 18, we see the battles that he's facing. He's in the middle of. We can't completely rule out a scenario that David may be dealing with a full-scale civil war at this point. At the very least, it's a possibility. And yet he waits on God because he knows that God is the one who is going to pluck his feet out of the net ultimately. In verse 19, he talks about both how many and how much people hate him. Not only just a few people strongly, it's not just a few people strongly dislike him, or that a lot of people are mildly annoyed at his leadership. No, the hatred towards him is both deep and wide. I would dare say that none of us today has experienced anything like David, what David's facing when so many people want to ruin you in every possible way. And yet David, in that moment, he's leaning on God because none, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. David knows that to be true. There's not a single need. There's nothing. David's situation for us, if we put ourselves in David's shoes, if we begin to feel what he's feeling, it can feel overwhelming to us. And yet, in David's mind, there's nothing that he's facing. There's nothing specifically, no specific challenge that he's dealing with that God's character isn't going to be sufficient. We need to see that. You see how practical it is to meditate on God when it it comes to leaning on God. One leads to the other. That's a practical thing. The more of God's ways we come to know, the more relevant he becomes in our hearts and minds in those moments. And there's not a single need that we can bring to him that he's going to miss or he's not sufficient for. We have to be convinced that he's trustworthy before we're willing to entrust ourselves to him. In other words, we have to believe that he's worth waiting on. For some of you, that may sound like a terrifying prospect. Maybe you've entrusted yourself to somebody before and you've been burned. And really, you're, you're kind of screaming down this track of never again. That's not, I'm never going to do that again in my life. Or maybe the weight of your sin and your guilt and your shame, it feels so great that it's just pulled you off in this ditch where you feel like, man, I can only count on myself. I can't look to anybody else. Nobody else, I'm not worth anybody else caring for. It's possible that past disappointments have just kind of stacked on top of each other, and so now you're kind of in this mode of just keep your expectations low. As long as we can just get through it and not be disappointed. Maybe you just sat down in despair. You really don't know which way to go. You know what each of those situations has in common? These questions start to just slide into our mind. If I wait on God, if I wait on him, will it be worth it? What if? What if he doesn't come through this time? Well, I told you we get to the whole chapter. And the answer to those questions is found in verses 20 to 22. Let's read those. David says, Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O oh God, out of all his troubles. David's lifting up a temporary situation here to the Lord. But he's either praying better than he knows Something far greater has caught his eye off in the distance. You see, the chapter seems to end without a resolution. There's not a major breakthrough as the chapter closes. David's still in this place of waiting as the psalm closes. But we know for sure, we know for sure that the Lord heard his prayer because we have the rest of the story. A thousand years later, Jesus Christ's perfect life, his substitutionary death, and his bodily resurrection became God's surprising and all-sufficient answer to every one of these requests. It was through one of David's own descendants. This is in God's wonder and his glory and in his mind of brilliance. It was through one of David's own descendants, one of the descendants that was going to inherit the earth, that God guarded and delivered David's own soul. It wasn't ultimately David's personal uprightness that was going to forever preserve him in the presence of God, but it was the absolute integrity of another who came. 
And the answer is a resounding yes for David. He's carrying the burdens of all of Israel on his shoulders. And yet there was one who came later and carried the burden of all of those who've ever looked to the Lord Jesus. The answer is yes, David. All of Israel on the cross that day was redeemed. All of Israel is being redeemed on this day. And all of Israel is going to be completely redeemed, get this, out of every single one of his troubles on that day. Christian, this morning, Christian, the shame of your sin, not somebody else's, your sin, the shame that you may feel right now, the troubles of your heart, the anxieties and the afflictions of your days, the ones that you feel like are, are weighing on you and that you are responsible for, those have been carried by another. They've been carried by another. And it's sure and it's certain the person and work of Jesus Christ for that specific thing that you're dealing with is more than sufficient for you because it is already finished. It has already been carried. Your circumstance and your situation has already been, that, that, that request has already been answered, yes and amen, in Jesus Christ. And one day in heaven, I bet we'll get to walk with David. I bet we'll get to ask him, what was going on when you wrote this? What was happening? How did God preserve you? How did he keep you? And was it worth the wait? Was it worth looking to him? How sweet it's going to be to hear that testimony from him. But you know what? You're going to have a story to tell him too. And yours isn't going to be any less sweet. Yours isn't going to be any less full of the glory of God and the faithfulness of God and the trustworthiness of God and the mercy and the steadfast love. So as we close, let's look at a few ways that God is directly pointing at us, and he's calling us from this psalm to actively hope in him. Pray. Pray about everything. We're in heaven yet, and the traps for your own soul and the nets that are waiting to snare you are everywhere. We're going to step in some of them. Our eyes must continually be on the Lord for deliverance, for help. Bring your requests. Bring your confessions. Bring your water bills. Bring your children. Bring your own soul. Bring it all to God. Now, that seems fundamental. It seems obvious to say that. But is that functioning in your life? Is that happening? Are you actively setting your hope in God, a certainty, by bringing things to him in prayer? prayer is missing in your life, then, then hope is going to remain small and problems and questions and circumstances are going to remain big and overwhelming. Philippians, Paul's instruction to the church in Philippi, he puts it this way, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That's a command. This is what David is doing in this psalm. He's, he's, the Lord is at hand, and I'm going to tell him each and every single one of my requests, all the things that I'm dealing with, because he is at hand and he is sufficient. And so we pray. Secondly, we read and we rehearse. We read and we rehearse. It does no good to theoretically claim that the gospel is sufficient for all of my needs, and yet still remain ignorant of the ways that it actually is sufficient for all of my needs how the gospel addresses specific circumstances and situations. Even more than that, if we've learned those things, it's, it does us no good if we forget all about them in the moments where we need them the most. If we say it's sufficient, we need to be able to remember that and make those connections. David meditated on God and his promises. We, we have even more and sure and better ones. We can bank on those. Listen, you won't lean on what you don't trust. And you can't trust what you don't know or what you forget. And so we need to be reading and we need to be rehearsing and we need to be meditating and following David's example. And finally, be willing to wait on God. Be willing to wait on him. In what area of your life is that the hardest to do right now? What area of your life? We all have areas of our life that we're just hesitant to wait on God for. It may not turn out the way we want it to turn out. It may not happen when we want it to happen. And so we're just hesitant to wait on him. 
Young single, are you willing to wait on God for that relationship? Parents, are you actively waiting on God for the future of your children? Senior saints, you finally earned a spot where you have some flexibility in your life. You have some ability to do the things that you want to do. Not that those things are wrong, but are you willing to entrust that season, that final stretch to the Lord where you're trusting him and looking to him saying, Lord, what would you have for me in this season? Non-Christian, are you willing? Are you willing to entrust your eternal soul to the, to the friend of sinners, to the Savior Jesus Christ, the one who has promised and he cannot turn back, that he is faithful and he is merciful to those who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He can't break that. For, that's for you this morning. The friendship of the Lord is for you this morning if you will turn from your sin and call on the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever situation, whatever person or whatever it is that's coming into your mind, that's kind of coming into your mind as we're talking about this, the Holy Spirit's bringing that specific thing. That's the thing I'm talking about. Is it worth leaning on God there with that? Notice in this psalm how David, over and over again, he's just speaking in absolute terms. He's speaking in absolute terms. It, it almost seems too good to be true. When he talks about how when people look to him, it's absolute. There's no exceptions. God is not going to fail those who are banking on him. He does not fail. He cannot fail. It's against who he is. He'd have to stop being God to fail you in that area of your life. Maybe it may not happen in your timing or the way that you would have pictured it. But listen, despite that, there's, a scenario, there's no scenario where he fails. There's no scenario where it's not ultimately good. There's no scenario where the blessings are not poured out on us for those who are looking and waiting because it's sure, because it's fixed, because we sing about this morning, it is finished. What happened on that day is what your surety is today. What was sufficient then, when Jesus said it is finished, that's the sufficiency. That's the moment. Everything else from there on is for us to grasp by faith and to meditate on and to look to God and to bring those things to God. We, you see how the gospel is supposed to be functioning. We are a gospel-centered people. That's what it looks like. Even with our sin, even with the things that we would prefer to keep hidden, even with the things that we think should keep us separated from God, God is faithful and he's steadfast, and those are the things that we bring to him. Those are the moments when we're facing the overwhelming, we don't know what to do. Those are the things we bring to God. Are you willing to trust him there? So David speaks to our question this morning. If I wait on God, if I just actively hope in a certainty... In the end, will it be worth it? This psalm this morning reminds us, and let it continue to remind us, remind you tomorrow when you walk out the door, absolutely yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word because it reveals you. It, it teaches us about your ways. Lord, we thank you that you have revealed your secret counsel to us and you've given it to us in the form of your word and through the, through the power of your Holy Spirit, opening our eyes and helping us to see the glory of your covenant that is unbreakable and how that meets every single one of our needs, Lord. And Lord, this morning, some of us are wrestling or maybe we're tired of wrestling or maybe there's circumstances that we don't know what to do. Lord, this morning, I pray that there would just be your spirit through your word would lift our gaze, would lift our gaze this morning to you, to your sufficiency. Lord, help us to see how a specific part of who you are and make that connection with the specific need that we have. And may we rejoice in that. May it bring great joy to us and strengthen our faith. And Lord, may your church be built as a result. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we know that you answered David. And we thank you for the certainty of that day. Lord, guide us 
Guide us as your people. Teach us in your ways and in your truths. In Jesus' name, amen.